feel like I'm doing okay. All right, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, as John said, my name is Lauren Clark. I'm with the Center for Maritime Archaeology in the University of Southampton. And uh, I'll be giving you guys a brief um, kind of look into my master's research on maritime archaeology in Albania, kind of trying to connect the dots on a, on a rather overlooked coastline. So, all right, so for those of you not familiar with the Balkans um, or Albania, it is situated just south of Montenegro, north of Greece and borders Macedonia on its inland eastern coast and has about over 400 kilometers of coastline along the eastern Adriatic, very, very, varying from large uh, coastal plains that are created by alluvial terraces all the way down to the large mountainous regions in the south. There's been a lot of terrestrial research in, in the interior of Albania and a lot of it's looked at um, prehistoric sites, but very little has been done in the Neolithic. There are some, did you hear laser pointer? Sorry, I'm gonna steal it. Um, the only areas that they've done really very much research in the Neolithic have been in the inland areas up in the mountain near the Corsa Basin and up in the, up in the northern mountains up near uh, Montenegro. And these inland sites kind of consist of, of smaller collections of, of Neolithic finds that lead into Bronze Age and Iron Age sites. Now the Bronze Age sites that you can see are illustrated on this map um, from the Edwards paper uh, show a lot more sites being investigated all along the river basins in, along the interior of Albania as well as some that dot the coastline. Uh, however, there really aren't that many sites that have been, have been noticed along the actual coastline itself, uh, which is something that I really hope future investigation can, can point out. The sites that you can see, um, the major Bronze Age sites near the coast, are up near the um, near Skodra, along along the northern rivers, near Lesta, down near Vlora, and in Saranda. So that's kind of a large range to go along the coast. Into the Iron Age, um, more sites are noted uh, by a lot of uh, scholars looking at Illyrian ties. Um, this is the this is the time period where. There's a lot more fortifications being drawn, and especially up near Skodra, there have been Iron Age fortifications noted underneath the medieval, uh, classical, and Roman uh, remains in that area. So this is also the time in the literature where we see people are referring to this whole, um, these, these groups of tribes in the northern areas of Albania and in the southern areas of the rest of the Balkans as the Illyrians. Um, it's unclear in some of the ancient texts and for Strabo, for example, whether the Illyrians refer to an actual cultural entity or whether it's a purely geological construct um, that describes a lot of the Roman territories in that area. So this group, um, they, in the, as you go through the Iron Age and into, into a lot of the classical Greek city-states forming in the south, uh, the Illyrians went through uh, kind of a little bit more of a unification as opposed to being distinct tribes and had multiple sets of kings and queens um, who participated in kind of expanding their, their empire uh, as it was down into the south and up into the north that's not pictured on this ancient map. Um, but they competed with specifically in Albania with the uh, Greek city-state of Epirus, which, is, which covers about half of modern-day Albania up through um, the Vlora region and the Illyrian lands come down into the cover the northern and central regions of what is modern day Albania. So some of the sites that you can see I have pictures of um, from my travels through Albania um, through this Greek and, and the occupation in Epirus is uh, Apollonia, Butrint, and Dyrrhachium, which was the Greek Epidamnos. So although underwater research in Albania um, is still undergoing its kind of growing process. Uh, this is a, a map that was done by RPM Nautical Foundation uh, that covers their main surveys through the southern portions of Albania, um, dot, noting um, both, both modern and ancient uh, wreck sites along the coast. As, as they keep moving up, hopefully, I'm actually really interested in seeing what the northern region um, looks like as compared to the kind of more in Greek influenced southern region. Uh, to see what those cultural differences between the Illyrian uh, influence and the Greek influence. The Illyrians, when you're looking at underwater research in Albania, the Illyrian influence will be specifically uh, kind of fun to look at as they're oftentimes referred to as, as pirates. 
and uh, kind of a ruthless, uh, efficient raiding parties, much like the Vikings were in Northern Europe. So it, it will be it'll be very interesting to see whether we will still find the same numbers of cargo ships like we have in in, in the southern portions for Alania. Just really quick, there's there's some some of the uh, sites that we investigated um, with RPM on the 2014 season um, using the sector scan sonar. Uh, just to give you an idea of what wrecks look like in this region, as it doesn't, they're vastly different than, than what you'll find here in North America or in, in Northern Europe. So most of the wrecks um, consist of large amphora piles, uh, storage cargoes uh, of wrecks because of the nature of the Mediterranean, uh, hardly any organics ever ever survive. So that looks, these, these are what, what you would look like, large, large conglomerates of, of storage containers, as well as um, smaller artifacts like lead anchor stocks and stone anchors have also been found. Now it's not just shipwrecks, there are some, there are a lot of um, remains of, structural remains of cities and uh, Butrent is one of the good examples of the, the aqueduct, the collapse, collapsed aqueduct in the, the Varit Channel. So that was kind of a little bit of a short introduction to Albania and I wanted to now move on to where my research came in, came into the overall uh, themes of what RPM has been doing and how it can kind of go on with future research. Um, I start out with a little bit of a story. I arrived in, in Albania in July of 2014 and all raring to go was my very first project that I'd been let off the leash and had my own project to design. Very excited about it, but before I could get started, uh, there were a couple of meetings that I had to do and one of them was, was with the head of the Albanian National Coastal Agency and in, Tirana, in the capital of Tirana. He was going to help me out with a lot of logistics for my project and they were very, very gracious. In meeting with him, we discussed some of the logistics for the project, but I was keen on getting, uh, getting his opinion on what I had sent to him as my research proposal. And I asked him if he'd gotten a chance to, to take a look at it. And after a very long and awkward silence, he looked me straight in the face and said, I don't like working with archaeologists. <laughs> Not necessarily the uh, hit the ground running start that I was looking for. <laughs> However, fortunately, he did elaborate, uh, make me feel a little bit better. Didn't think I was going to get uh, kicked out of the country right then. Um, he, he just expressed a lot of his frustration with previous archaeological ex excavations and um, you know sites that have been done by the Albanian Institute as well as, as um, other institutes where Archaeologists, we have a ten tendency to focus on individual sites, which is great for us. But what he really he has a vision for this coastline, and he really wants to put Albania on the map culturally with other countries and connect these ancient coastlines. Because he's very adamant about saying, you know, mod modern boundaries don't mean anything. He said, you know, especially when you're looking at research like the, that, you're looking at for Neolithic and Bronze Age, especially. So. He's got a real vision for connecting Albania and putting it in a larger context of the Mediterranean maritime landscapes and cultural landscapes. So my project um, coming in, which made me feel good because I wasn't looking at any individual sites, um, I really wanted to create a baseline for data um, looking at, at um, what cultural sites that could be found underwater as well as what has been found and uh, how that can connect to and, and create kind of a larger um, database for research. So I really wanted to look at connecting some terrestrial sites uh, with the existing maritime sites in their, in their context and within Albania as a whole and not just as their connection between site A and site B. Um, which that also allowed me to shift, so shifting the focus to um, broader connections between, between different time periods and between different sites. And this is, a really important part of my of my dissertation that I'll focus a little bit more on, more on today than maybe the cultural aspect is factoring in data sets and making it a very multidisciplinary research uh, research project, uh, looking at coastal morphology changes and how that affects the landscape that you're looking at when you when you're finding these sites, and hopefully putting all those things together, you can kind of paint an overall picture of the maritime landscape in in Albania, how it was used and how that can actually help uh, for future research on, on any type of site uh, within, within Albania and in the uh, inland or maritime. So there are a lot of different fields that we deal with in maritime archaeology. That's one of the great things about it. So for, for this specific study, I looked at archaeology, anthropology, obviously, 
um, looked a little bit at biology and ecology, um, geology, and I also thought it was very important to look at how what their vision is for um, tourism-based research and, and the commercial research, which involved um, several conversations with some people from the American-based Shell Corporation looking at their surveys, uh, offshore surveys that they had done in and around Albania. So boiling down the multidisciplinary approach, I looked at a couple of different, um, different areas, including sea level changes, tectonics, sedimentation, and erosion. So this is, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this if you work in the Mediterranean. This is from Landbeck and Purcell's 2005 study, which is the widely accepted um, sea level curves for the Mediterranean. Um, it's a bit hard to see. The red lines indicate negative values. The orange lines indicate positive values, and the yellow lines being um, neutral values for 20,000 years ago at the last glacial maximum, 12,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and 2,000 years ago. And don't worry, I'll zoom into Albania here in a little bit because it's a little bit hard to see. So on this on this accepted chart, we've got Albania sitting at 20,000 years ago at 125 to 130 meters below the present sea level. 55, 50 to 55 meters at 12,000 years ago, 4 to 6 meters at 6,000 years ago, and 3 to 4 meters at 2,000 years ago. While, 100, while 50 to 55 meters seems like a large amount of water, um, along this coastline, it really depends on where you are. Uh, I included a picture of some of the multi-beam data from RPM on this bottom slide to show that the, the, the coast um, and the, the continental shelf in this area actually doesn't extend out very far. It drops off very quickly, and it's not uncommon to have sites in over 90 meters of water. So these, when you're looking for prehistoric landscapes, things like that, this area would be specifically tough as, as even these large amounts of um, sea level change would not have affected uh, overall you know, land area quite as much as up in the north or even on the Gulf of Mexico and other places. Some other uh, methods for testing sea level change in this area of the world, um, people, uh, Antonioli and Lambic, uh, as well as well as Pirazzoli and Fleming and others have used uh, archaeological sites to, to date sea level changes, uh, which is kind of the opposite of what I'm looking at in this, uh, in this study. But there are, as you, you can read those studies if you'd like, but there are uh, inherent issues with using archaeological sites to date sea level change. Um, Due to the broad nature of, of analysis and the fact that there are fluctuations in the sea levels as to when they're and when these sites were abandoned as to when they are used and what they were used for. Um, another key thing that I'm hoping will be, get done in Albania a little bit later, I didn't quite have enough time myself, um, is to investigate some tidal notches. Uh, that These are from Croatia and even though in a microtidal zone like the, like the, the Mediterranean and the Adriatic, um, they're still very Clearly noticeable uh, notches that get cut into into the limestone and the and the sediment, so that you can uh, and you can see these are clearly submerged now, that indicating a, a higher sea level. However, there's a reason that Lambeck and Purcell's study uh, covers only uh, tectonically stable areas in the Mediterranean to create those curves, because it's a pain in the butt. Tectonics in Albania. Albania is an extremely tectonically um, unstable area. There's um, many microplates that, that surround the Peri-Adriatic Plate, which covers most of the Adriatic Sea. And there's folding and slipping uh, on many of these plate, uh, many of these plates, which cause regional variances. So some of those large sea level curves don't really mean a whole lot on the local level when it comes down to even just one whole country's coastline. This is just, just a graphic uh, representation um, from the Burton's 2002 study on, um, on the frequency of earthquakes um, in and around the Aegean and the Adriatic. And you can just see Albania over on the side uh, with, I mean, this is from 550 BC to 1899 AD. And these are, are just um, medium range uh, earthquakes. And so you have quite a few epicenters going in and around Albania. The key thing about earthquakes and tectonics is there's there's catastrophic traffic events and there are, are gradual events and both can can play a huge impact on the on the maritime cultural landscape especially for for sites that are port sites 
So I'm going to really quickly, because I'm running out of time, on uh, sedimentation and erosion. It's not just the tectonics and sea level change. You really have to look at what sediments are being carried by the rivers into, into these, the mouths and the ports. And uh, over time, there's, there's many studies done on lots of different ports in the Mediterranean and around the world on increased sedimentation. The two sites in Albania that are, are some of the most noticeable are the Apollonia, which was actually in a riverine port, and Betrayant in the Vivari Channel. And I'm going to have to skip through these really quickly. Uh, Albania, or, uh, Apollonia is now about six kilometers inland, although you can see the coast. Um, there's no rivers that, that go <laughs> by it now. This is a study by Eric Fouache, um, where he actually went into a whole bunch of different boreholes, documenting the differences um, in the, both the Siman and the Viosa River. And the Viosa River is actually the ancient river that supplied Apollonia's port and as you can see, it's, Apollonia is uh, right there on the map. And so those two rivers are nowhere near it right now. And because of a lot of, there's, he goes very in depth in this study. Because of those processes, the that entire area has, has become kind of an alluvial and flooded plain um, that now has no access to the ocean. So it's, a, it's another thing to really keep in mind when you're going through and looking at sites that are now inland that might have been on the coast. Butrain, although the site itself has not been terribly impacted um, by sedimentation, like on the little on the small peninsula, the the Varina Plain, which is right next to Butrain, uh, has has transgressed into the Vivari Channel quite a bit over over time. As you can see, these are um, freely accessible on the Butrain website. This is from uh, RPM's multi-beam data. Uh, you can see down. The trend is right here, and this is the Verena Plain where all these rivers, and because of industrialized farming, there's been quite a bit of sediment that's coming out into the Corfu Channel and kind of blocking off some of the Verena, Verena Plain, and that may, plays a huge part in excavating anything in Patrint, as well as any of the associated maritime um, connections with the, with the greater Adriatic Sea. So the site formation processes and, and the coastal change involved with all of those sea level change, sedimentation, and erosion. It's very important to look at all of those things before going out and trying to find something. I mean, we don't. It's it's impossible uh, without proper 3D models and, th and proper data to to actually know what the what the coastline looked like. And if you walk out there now and think that that's what the coastline looked like when you're talking about Neolithic or even in into Roman and and uh, Greek sites, you're you're very wrong. And so I'm going to go. I'm going to end with it by by saying that there is Albania is an extremely rich area um, for research. And while RPM is doing quite a bit of work, and the Albanian Center for Marine Research is doing quite a bit of work in Albania, um, there's all those multidisciplinary fields that I noted really need to um, build up a data set there before before um, more archaeological. <coughs> research can be done. So I especially like to thank the Albanian National Coastal Agency, who was very nice to me, <laughs> despite the very the very first meeting. <laughs> and RPM Nautical Foundation, Center for Maritime Archaeology, and my advisors and fellow students at the, center, at the University of Southampton. Thank you.